a little panel. We're running a little bit early, which is just crazy for a conference. So thank you guys for, uh, for, for keeping us uh, on track and honest. But that gives us a little bit more time to, to have a conversation. I've been collecting some questions. Christian, you just highlighted perhaps another one. So keep that in mind, because I did not write that down. But, uh, and then we're going to try, uh, it, once we, we have a bit of a dialogue, we've got this uh, catch box, which if you were here, or not here, but if you were in Stockholm last year, we, we tried this. Uh, it's a little microphone that we can throw around. This is quite a large room, though. So, you know, if somebody up in the bleachers raises their hand, and I don't know that I could toss it that far. But uh, I think we'll have microphones as well. We'll take some questions. Um, but to kick this off, we'll, we'll start with some simple ones. I gave you guys a bit of a warning on this. so, uh, And I've added some more, given that we have more time. And so I'm going to ask, ask the question, and each of you just give, give your answer. So PC or Mac? Mac. <laughs> Mac. Oh, PC. Mac. OK. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Tea. Coffee. <laughs> Danish. Maybe we should switch. Favorite Star Wars character? Oh. Uh, Boba Fett. <laughs> Chewbacca. Yoda. Are you currently jet lagged? No. Am I currently what? Currently jet lagged. No. Nope. I currently feel jet lagged, but it's not because of the time difference. <laughs> <laughs> if if you were if you had to if you could work anywhere you're you wanted, besides where you currently work, what industry or service would you work in? I've always uh, uh, been passionate about car design, actually. It's actually where I wanted to uh, go in early in my career. So I guess if I had to pick one, maybe uh, Pininfarina in Italy. <laughs> uh, something related to ecology of the global environment. Ecology of the global environment, OK. Well, I'm more or less just started in my current job, so I haven't really given that a lot of thought. Uh, I actually love what I'm doing right now, but I would say that watching these, these, these buildings go up and these people flying around and, and things being actually built and kind of being visible as opposed to spreading design, I would love to work in construction and just see stuff being built. It's pretty cool. All right, and uh, we, we've got our mind, at, you know, we're, we're here now, but we, we have our mind on the next conference. What, which city would you love to see the service design conference in next? Which city? Well, you know, I've spent a lot of time recently in Singapore. I think there's a huge um, boom in, in design, actually, happening in Singapore. I've been uh, hiring quite a bit, as I said earlier, a, a big studio there. And it's an it's a incredible culture and, and a lot of innovation happening in that region of the world. So I think that'd be a an option. All right. I think we're going to Cape Town. Cape Town? Yeah, I feel Cape Town. Cape Town? Have you been to Cape Town? I have been to Cape Town. Is it nice? I've never been. I haven't. There's a lot of, there's a lot of amazing things going on there, good and bad. So it's kind of the, the mix, uh, the potpourri of a whole bunch of opportunity happening all at once. OK. So there's actually a major design conference happening in Cape Town in, uh, I think, uh, March or April uh, next year. <laughs> called uh, Design in Daba. Uh, but that being said, uh, I, would, I would actually suggest um, Santiago, Chile. Uh, it's a really, really cool city, and they are beginning to really understand not just startup culture, which of course Chile is like a leading nation in uh, startup Chile, but also uh, understanding design and innovation also in government. So I would, uh, I would, uh, I would go to Chile. They got 6,000 applicants, 6,000 applicants for a handful of positions in the government innovation team. So I think they're pretty engaged. Nice. All right, now this is by no means going to be the actual vote that determines where the conference is next year, but, but just out of curiosity by showing of applause, which you've done earlier and I know you can do, uh, Singapore. <laughs> Cape Town. Santiago. All right. We have a winner. You probably won't be there. Maybe one year. 
Okay, uh, so that's the, the end of the rapid fire. As, as fun as those may be, we'll, we'll get into something a little bit more, more meaty and serious. Um, so I thought it was, it was interesting that, that everybody hit on design is, is, is coming into these organizations, you know, is, is coming into finance, we need more design in healthcare, we need more design in government services and social issues. And the, the word, I mean, the care came in, like, okay, do, do we, uh, we, we're not really, it seems like we've lost care, it seems like this isn't obvious, you know, you mentioned the, the, the cracks have been there all along, and, and I've, I've heard this, I've had this conversation and question with, with other people, like, why, why is service design not obvious? Why, why is this not common sense? Why are we suddenly noticing the cracks now? It's for well, anybody. I have one point of view. I, you know, I think that uh, design has become part of the, um, the narrative in, in culture more and more. And you can, you can maybe point to uh, brands like Apple that have made it sort of a, a thrust in the way that when they introduce a new product or they just talk about user experience, they've made it such a so, you know, the narrative that then all of the um, media covers. So then people start to, you know, when that's all that's being talked about, people start to take more notice of it and then start to have something to compare and contrast. So I think that as brands have, you know, some of the earlier brands that have really uh, focused on design as almost their product in a sense, um, and, and the mass adoption of it has created this sort of, this, this new uh, focus on it. And I'd also say that just uh, just generations, you know, you know, the newest you know, generations have grown up with digital, you know, digital technologies, they're digital natives, and that's how they interact with the world more and more. So they're this, they're more experts to be able to um, evaluate design um, and how user experience works. So it becomes just more of a more popular conversation. So so an example would be this uh, project I mentioned at the Danish National Hospital, where when the the hospital, uh, the leader, the, the, the head nurse uh, uh, approached us at, at, at MindLab. Uh, she said, listen, we've had rounds after rounds after round of efficiency uh, and cutbacks. And we need to run faster and faster and faster. And just like you showed how we've, you know, we've focused on quality, on eliminating error, we've used lean uh, production techniques, but it's like we're reaching the breaking point here. And we can't go further down that road. We can't keep optimizing. What would be a different way? And I think a lot of organizations are asking what might be a different way and how might those tools, many of them, which are actually, again, this strain of decision making tools and finer and finer and finer ways of optimizing, how might we do something that is, in a sense, radically different? So, for example, in this case, example, in this hospital, the question which was really disruptive to them was what might be a meaningful patient experience? And just having the doctors and nurses accept that that was a relevant question. Because what did that have to do with anything? We're fixing people here. We're fixing people's hearts. They, they actually, we're, we're keeping people alive here. What does it have to be a meaningful experience? And we had to then dig back into evidence from the early 1970s that demonstrated that actually there's a connection between a meaningful, caring experience on the one hand and health outcomes on the other. And suddenly it was like, okay, if that is a tentative hypothesis, at least that we can accept that, let's explore that. And it turns out, and also in this project, and I think in every single time that the way to radically better services and better outcomes, but also to radical savings and efficiencies goes through what you might call a human-centered approach or human-centered governance, human-centered business models, ways where they put people at the heart of it. And so I think, I think the, the, the rise of design and service design has also got to do with this, in a sense, a human turn, like a human turn. Uh, paradoxically, in an age of technology and, 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 to, and management tools and so on, suddenly we're, we're getting human beings into focus again. Uh, and a lot of people are energized by that. And I think that that's, that's, um, it creates this momentum behind design. I, I, I think we have a huge opportunity in the United States to focus on not the impact of doing the design within organizations, there's a huge opportunity there, but I've probably had a bigger impact on the future of design in healthcare in the United States, not through the work I've been doing with large healthcare organizations, but actually through the work I do at universities and providing people with learning opportunities and future generations of healthcare leaders to actually understand that there are other tools um, that they can use besides the traditional quality tools and operational tools that they learn about in school. And, 
in the United States particularly, there's, there's a, that's where we hold, the, I think, a huge potential to, to make an impact on, well, why isn't this logical? Why don't people understand it? Well, it, oftentimes they don't have really good opportunities to learn about it uh, today. And if we can spread that broader and get more people engaged in that conversation earlier in their careers, that could have a transformational effect down the stream. Yeah, so I, I think that's uh, great advice. And it makes me think about a lot of the challenges that many of us face with the organizations that we're in, especially if they've been around for a while or or maybe if you've been acquired by an organization recently and you're part of now a larger organization that's a different culture, how you influence that culture and, and, and that's, that structure that's been around for a while and you know, hasn't had that focus, I think that's one of the big challenges that, that a lot of us face. You know, we're not all Airbnbs or Ubers that have been you know, designed with that in mind and you know, perhaps in the, in the future, we'll see that be more prevalent as the newer companies grow up. But for the, the large organizations now, what, what can we do to help accelerate, accelerate that, that uptake? Or what challenges do you see that, that are barriers to service design being accepted in the current uh, in industrial structure? Sorry. Anyone? Yeah. Uh, you know, that's definitely a huge theme at City, for sure. I even mentioned it earlier. Um, changing a 200-year-old cult culture, you know, to be uh, more agile and more design-centric and, and more user-centric takes time, you know. And I think that there, at the fundamental level, it's about um, creating environments that, you know, build confidence and trust with each other um, to sort of take that risk and feel okay that there's sort of a safety net and that we're all in it together. So it's a sense of camaraderie and you know, really um, demonstrating that in the behaviors every day, just allowing for those types of environments for free ideas, to, you know, ideas to flow freely. But then there's more of like, okay, that's that's all fine and good, but how do you actually do it tactically? And the one thing that we're doing, um, I mentioned it in the, in my slide, was this this really embracing design thinking. Now all of us would say, oh, that's obvious. That's just sort of the creative process. You know, that's what we go through. But that's actually fundamentally different than the way that the bank is typically thought about problem solving or opportunity finding. Um, so adding, adding that rigor um, and that process that you can actually put on a board and, 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 a ch and a process chart so that the rest of the organization can understand the process you go through actually creates um, engagement points for the rest of the organization that might not be, uh, you know, have a creative background or sort of be comfortable in that state of ambiguity when you're trying to figure out the solution that they actually have something that they can, they can look at from a rational standpoint and know how they can um, interact with the team and get involved. So actually having that process and that methodology is really important just to, 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 um, to invite people in, to make everybody feel creative. And you know, the, my last point is that we're actually taking it one step further. So I'm training my entire design team uh, around the world um, to be practitioners, design thinking practitioners. We're working with IDEO. They're gonna um, train the entire company, um, or my group, I should say, um, to be experts in design thinking, but also um, uh, have a, we're going to train the trainers, is what we call it. So we're actually going to create a facilitators group of evangelists, design thinking evangelists. And those select few, those select design leaders, are actually going to end up parachuting into other parts of the organization when there needs to be some sort of creative rethinking and, and sort of grassroots um, that way of thinking um, sort of permeate it through the organization. So that's actually a tactical way we're doing it. Um, but I don't say I think it does come down to behaviors and, and feeling, uh, allowing people to express themselves freely. A couple of maybe quick thoughts on it is that design is foreign to a lot of organizations. I think that's your point. And how do you get broader acknowledgement, acceptance, adoption um, of it? And I, I think there's an awesome platform out there at most organizations today. And I'm not quite sure, but uh, on why this is, but innovation is a language that most every organization understands today. Um, well, at least they understand the concept, and maybe they struggle then at, well, how do we, how do we embed this, or how do we, and they, they at least want it. They at least want it, right? So you can ride the wave there. I mean, that's been an opportunity um, for me to ride that innovation wave and start that, take that conversation to the next level um, about how you can use design to enable that innovation. But then. The other part is this context piece, and Christian referred to this a, a little bit as well, is when you bring that conversation into the organization, you have to take into consideration the, the culture, the leadership, the context um, for having that conversation and tailoring that 
to those attributes of that organization to be super successful. I mean, it, it's good design, right? Uh, don't come in cold and say, this is what we need, and, and slam in an off-the-shelf solution. You really have to design the approach um, tailored to you know, the unique attributes of that context and that organization. Yeah, so, so when I was uh, designing or, or preparing this uh, doctoral research that I shared with the, with the design leadership, uh, I was thinking that you know I'm just finding these 15 random leaders and then seeing how design, service design transformed them, transformed, blew them away. And it, but it turns out that if you pick 15, you find 15 uh, managers or leaders who've successfully worked with designers, they're not just random people. It turns out that these are actually very, very extraordinary people who have a track record of always being curious, of always being ambitious. And this is not the first time they've been ambitious or curious. This time they engage with service design. One of the folks I interviewed said, you know, I always look for opportunities to disrupt my organization. I always look for some kind of new, he didn't say management fad, but he said a management tool to try stuff out. And so I think the lesson from that is that we have to look for, we almost have to like have a due diligence across the organization saying, where are those managers or leaders who already are doing this kind of stuff? They just don't know it's, that design could, could be part of it. They, they don't have the tools, they don't, they're not aware that here's a whole, a, a rich profession and professionals who could uh, help them achieve what they want to achieve. And, and then the other side, of course, is the education side, which is, I mean, as a political scientist, I, 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 we, we never discussed even how to create futures. We didn't discuss, uh, or I didn't learn in, in university how to create anything. I learned how to compare stuff, manage stuff, govern stuff, as if the world is a static place, and as if you know we're just managing problems, which is why we have so many of them, isn't it? That we're just managing them, we're not <laughs> changing them, right? We're not changing problems into opportunities, perhaps. We, we have no, no language around it, no vocabulary. And the same goes not just for political scientists, for engineers, for lawyers, for you know, across the board of the different professions. So how do we build that? I mean, I talked to um, uh, well, um, a design leader yesterday who said we need an, an extra semester, right? We need the extra semester in, in the MBA uh, classes to, to, to teach design. And maybe designers also need the extra semester on management and organization and organizational change. Everybody up here is nodding, so I assume we, we all agree. <laughs> while, while that's true, and, and, and I think, I mean, I, I definitely agree, and one of the, the things that I really appreciated about getting my master's at, at Carnegie Mellon is we did, we did study design management and organizational change, and I can't say that that helped at least get, getting some awareness, but, you know, it didn't necessarily... Uh, set me up for all the conversations I would need to have, and one of the the big ones that that I get asked a, a lot is how do you get service design moving? How do you prove the value? How do you have conversations with business leaders that don't understand and are looking for what is this going to get me beyond care? Which you know, and I, and I really like. I don't know if yesterday the there was a student day and. Uh, your 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 care thing made me rem reminded me of this. They um, they did a little design challenge around using non currency currency, so things like uh, care or um, drawing a blank. If you're in the audience, shoot, shout it out. But uh, but how do we use these things that are not currency to to trade and exchange value with each other? Uh, but that's not a language of of, of business, and I think it it, it is more likely a language of design, but, but, but having those conversations. So what, what advice do you, have to, do you have to give to the people who are asking, how do we have that conversation? How do we, how do we prove the value of design? And you seem like you have something to say. Well, well, well so everybody is, is, is studying the value of design, right? So DMI's research from last year, Design Value Index, a surprise, the European Commission just did this major study of how, how businesses are using design. At the DDC, we're, we're shaping a new study for next year with the Danish Industry Association on the value, guess what, the value of design. But I actually think that the best proof or the best, the most powerful way is just to do it and, 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 and try it out. 
And I think that's the first step in any organization to just start doing it because uh, nobody can go back from there. I mean, I've never, I, I haven't seen any manager who really run a design project who, who, who says, well, it didn't, didn't work, uh, we'll try something else next time. Yes, it could be hard, yes, it can be tough, yes, there can be failure, but there's something really, really profound about doing it. And that is why this whole notion of design as thinking is actually deeply problematic. Because, you know, how many of you saw the front page of Harvard Business Review last month? Right, design thinking, and it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a front page, it's a suit, the head is cut off, and so you have the body there, which is the, the doing and the, the, the action and the, the artifacts and the smells and the sounds, that's the body, right? And then you have the head cut off, and it says the evolution of design thinking. As if you can separate the thinking and the doing. And as trained designers would know, I think, those two things can be separated. It's, it's doing an action, right? Thinking and action. So that's really, really problematic. And so if we, to get the doing into the designing, we need to bring professional designers into organizations. You're, 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 you're not equipped as a leader, as a manager, if you do not have professional designers you can work with. So, so, so and, and how do you do that? Well, the first step is to just get, it, get, get started. That, that's the only way, you have to experience it. And that's, of course, that's the uh, hen and the egg, or that's the catch-22 problem. That's why we at the DDC are providing just a little bit of cash for organizations to say, we know you think this is risky, but trust us, we're the government, uh, try this out, it can't go wrong, and, uh, and there will be no turning back once you've tried it. Yeah, I think, th yeah, design making is, is key, and less planning, more doing, is, is a phrase that we use a lot. Um, because you can, yeah, just get out of your own way. Again, just like start, start making. I think just to, to your earlier question um, around metrics, how do you prove, prove it out? We look at it two ways, at least I look at it two ways. One is like the briefing process. We look first at real analytics, you know, especially from a digital perspective. We can actually see if something's successful or not. And we take that metric, whether it's engagement scores or, or in, in our case, conversion numbers and, and uh, completed applications and those types of metrics, as well as NPS, which is more of a qualitative um, metric that we use a lot, just to see how just the customer feels, how likely they are to refer and recommend the brand, which is a, a great metric um, that we use to actually inform the process. That's actually, so it's, it's baked in from the beginning. And then we've got our, our baseline, and then we, as we do our process, we can hopefully show the improvement, the delta, at the end of it. So that's, that helps as far as um, proving out the numbers. But I think on top of that, what's really important is good storytelling. And we're investing in a, a media lab um, specifically, you know, just honestly, just a handful of folks to cut videos, create stories that around the before and the after, um, be, and cut little two minute, three minute films that we can then distribute widely. You know, we have 300,000 people in the company. We have to push that out to prove that we move the needle. And, it, and, it's, and it's a great vehicle to do that, just nice, tight video storytelling. And um, yeah, so those, those two ways, I think, uh, are gonna move the needle. Anything more to add? I'd, uh, maybe just reinforce. I, I think you're spot on is around getting it done or doing it. You know, uh, six years ago when I joined United Health Group, there wasn't a lick of strategic or service design, you know, really resonant in the company. So I was faced with the challenge of, well, I know it's the right thing to do. I know it can help this company be transformational in the industry. How and where do you get started, you know, inside of a, a massive company? And it's, it's literally just figuring out where you can find uh, some resources, um, just a little bit. It doesn't take a lot. Just find some resources to get something going um, and do it. But, and I'd also add the importance of the professionalism behind it, because I've seen a lot of organizations try with, I read this book and I know post-its are important, so let's have a meeting and we'll show people how to design, right? And, you know, which is, which is awesome. <laughs> which, it, which is an awesome attempt, but it usually doesn't hit the mark. You know, you see a lot of people fail because of that, because they're not really demonstrating the, the potential. You're not helping people, you know, get that understanding they need to get excited about it and propagate it inside the company. So, so, so may, maybe just another dimension to this, which, which hasn't really been mentioned explicitly, but it's about organizational learning. And I do agree, I think it's excellent you're doing the videos. It is actually, you know, we, we're trying to do that as well, right? We're trying to open up the black box, follow what's going on, uh, document, film, so on. And I think it, any, any change project of any kind in an organization, using the service design or not, you gotta have the, 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 the practical level and you gotta have a reflection level. Where as an organization, as a leadership, you, you, you reflect on and, and try to understand what's going on and what can we learn from this. 
and, and, and if you don't have that sophistication, uh, that level of, uh, of reflection in an organization, then you're going to be bound to repeat the same mistakes, right? And so what you're doing, I think, is just creating that, both the documentation, but also the tools for actually an, a, allowing that reflection. And yes, of course, I mean, I agree. You have to also put in some metrics of different kinds. I mean, whether they are quantitative or they're qualitative, probably got to be both, right? You got to have some financial metrics, but you also got to have some experiential metrics. Uh, but having, building that whole set of practices around that so to be professional at change, which this is all about, I think is the hall hallmark of, of a great organization, actually. I think Herb Simon had some ideas about reflection in action. Donald Schoen has. Oh, John Donald Schoen. Yeah, yes. Damn, wrong guy. I didn't just say that. Um, before we, we jump to the audience, I actually wanted to follow up on the, uh, in terms of measurement, how do you measure care? Yeah. Well, I, I think the, um, the best Do you measure, measure care? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think you measure it, though, in terms of how people feel. You know, and that's the thing that gets a little scary from a business perspective. You ask directly? Right? You ask them. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. I mean, it, it, that's the point of view that matters. We tell, you know, this whole conference is about creating value, right? And if you ask people about value in healthcare from a patient perspective, what's the number one thing that's most important? We boil it all down. It's like, does somebody care about me? Does anybody care about me? How are they caring about me? You know, I mean, sharing recent hospital experiences, you know, and obviously coming at it from a designer point of view, you know, and a, actually a, a very scary and, and traumatic experience I had recently, and I thought about as I headed myself to the emergency room to take care of um, my loved one who was there, and I thought about what are my expectations, you know, and go into this emergency room, right? And I, you know, and it's like, obviously I want them to be safe and be professional and know what they're doing and all those types of things, but that should be built in. The kind of the unknown factor, kind of to me was, are these people, I mean, do they really, really care? Because I need them to care as deeply as they possibly can about whether my daughter in this case is going to be safe, is gonna be healthy, and they're gonna do whatever they can possibly do to help that, right? So that's the, that's the element that in those situations matters most. Um, and yeah, you can, I can feel it. The minute I walked in that door, I could tell. I mean, you can tell very quickly whether someone is a person who is there to care and cares about you or whether it's not quite there the way it should be, you know? And, and so it's not that hard to measure. And I think if any of you, I mean, you shared an experience where it's, it's just, it's, sometimes it's not there and we know it. And so that's, that's the ultimate measure, whether it's there or not there. So, so it's always great with anecdotes and it's especially great with healthcare anecdotes because they're, they're always, there's a lot at stake, right? There's a lot at stake. So, so when we did the ethnography in, in, in this hospital, at one point, uh, we are observing, right? We are just hanging out observing in this clinic, and this young doctor rushes in and talks to a heart patient, an older heart patient. And as the young doctor is explaining the procedure and the operation that's gonna happen, the patient falls asleep. And the doctor doesn't notice. And rushes out the door again after a while. And the nurse sees it, and, uh, and uh, the, the man's uh, wife sees it. And nobody reacts. And again, not so much care going on, but a lot of um, pressure to be efficient going on. It's, it's it, observing, it's just the most powerful thing that can be. And of course you can tell. Deep, <laughs> all right. So we're gonna transition from those deep thoughts to this little green box and, uh, and questions that you have. So does anyone have a question for anyone or all three of the panelists or anything to, to and does this work? Is that how I felt, really? Hello? OK. Hi. Uh, does this work? OK. Hi. I just want to follow up that question uh, about care to ask really whether you can design for care, because I think we can we can design things that stimulate care. We can design situations in which you feel that people care. People smile. People care. Try this. Okay. <coughs> so my question is whether people, whether it's possible to design for care, and uh, although we can design sim simulations of caring, um, sometimes I feel that the more that we design for staff the less they care because they feel that they've been designed for and they haven't been involved in the designing themselves. 
so, so, um, so I was writing a, a paper about this hospital project not so long ago and uh, in, in talking again with a the, with the leading nurse there. And she told me that because service design is almost always, when it's good, it's collaborative, right? Involves staff, involves patients, involves the entire set of actors around a, a given service journey, a given, a, given, a given process. And she was telling me how this one nurse, after the project, when she was walking down the hall in this hospital, she kept having in the back of her, her head the patient's voices, the voices that was, you know, we'd use video, uh, uh, mostly audio recordings of patient narratives, patient stories, and so on from, from the research, the design research. And so she couldn't, she was transformed by the experience to the point where when she was walking down the hall and caring for patients, she, she had those narratives and those stories in the back of her mind. And I think, you know, that's incredibly powerful. And if, if that's not designing for care, I don't know what it is. And a lot of what we can do is empower our care professionals to do what got them into the industry, oftentimes to begin with. It, it, uh, honestly, some of it is as simple as that. You know? And if you do that right in a collaborative manner and you're understanding them and you're looking to support and enable them to do what they know they need to do and what they're inspired to do, it's easy. I mean, it, it, we can get there. It's just a, it's a matter of focus. You know, it, it really is a matter of focus. And we, that's, my, uh, that's my plea uh, to put you know, caring at the top of the chart. And um, I'm here to help make caring contagious. So anybody who wants a free hug over the rest of the conference, <laughs> let me know. Let me know. Let's do this. Let's do this. All right. Hi. I, I love the conversation about care. I'm wondering if any of you have given thought to the dominant economic paradigm we're all sort of embedded within, which has a profit imperative, and um, is part of a bigger wicked problem. So I think no one would argue with the fact that we need more care, we want to give more care. But do you find that this profit imperative is at odds with some of these objectives or not? Oftentimes it is, uh, but sometimes it's, uh, it's not a barrier, um, it's a factor. Um, it's a factor, which they can coexist completely. They're not always at odds. And that was a little bit of my point around the context right now, is that the context, you know, with a lot of the changes in the healthcare industry um, around consumerism, but a lot of the things triggered by the uh, Affordable Care Act in the United States have actually created this amazing platform where you can make a business case and a business model around care. And this is, this is what has contributed to the, the launch of Harkin Health, because we believe now is the time where you can launch a business that is focused on optimizing around care delivery and be successful at it. And uh, you, you're exactly right. It was much more difficult to do it prior, but we're at this extraordinary point right now where I believe it's uh, the right pieces are in place. Other questions? We got one down here. We got one up there. Hello, I'm interested in the video. Was it more internal or external? And, and was it three minute enough to convey the, the, the information that you really wanted to, to convey in it? The, the approach for um, videos, as I was describing, is more internal audience. Um, it's, so it's, it's rapid, you know, and it's meant to tell a story sort of in the, the bank vernacular a little bit to help socialize the impact of design. Now, granted, those stories could also be if, um, made external facing as well, you know, especially if. You know, as I said earlier, the, the purpose of the brand is to enable progress. And, and there actually is a video series on YouTube. You can look it up. It's um, Progress Makers. And they're actually nice uh, sort of long-form TV spots is the way to think about them. They're really long-form content stories about how City has enabled some, um, some inspired people to realize their dreams and impact the world. Um, so th there's like a nice uh, sort of interchange between the two. And oh, and to answer your question, I think three minutes is plenty of time. I think if you can't tell it in a minute, then maybe it's too complex a story. Good advice. Okay, I just wanted to get back to the conversation about uh, convincing organizations to try service design. Um, and you were talking about identifying those people who can believe in it and leaders who can make it happen. And I think that's a very important first step, but at a certain point, you're going to have to go to the people that deliver the service, in the case of the hospital, it was the doctors, and basically ask them to question the job they've been doing all their life. And 
they are not necessarily the ones who are convinced. So how do you get, as a designer, somebody, probably somebody external, to get that credit to have them question what they're doing? I mean, I mean, again, having studied these, um, well, doing all the work at MindLab for about eight years and then studying these particular projects, I would say that, that it is, I mean, often very, very painful. It's very, very painful to be confronted with the fact that what you thought you were doing, and in many cases in government services certainly, but also in a lot of businesses, you hope and think you're doing something good for clients, for citizens, for customers. And as you know, the saying goes, no strategy survives meeting reality, no service survives really meeting uh, users. Uh, every time you observe and watch that interaction uh, or those relations, there's something that can be improved, right? Every time there's something that, Good service designers know this. Every time there's something that can be improved, which means that setting expectations as you enter into service design work with staff, with teams, that this is going to be challenging. And we, already, we know so much about it already. We can, we can prepare people for this. I think we can prepare managers for this. And then those are, yeah, whatever. And then we do it. And of course, they are challenged. And then, I mean, I've seen cases where top leaders had to like nurse the whole organization, saying, we're not bad people. We're not, you know, we're not trying to kill anyone. Uh, we, 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 can, we can fix this, or we can, be, we, can, we can transform this to become a much, more, much better organization. I think the power of design for public services versus design or versus evaluation is that design is not about blaming, and design, service design is not about pointing fingers, or not about, actually, not about evaluating. What it's about is, is, is about creating. It's about making things better. And because designers have the tools and approaches to bring staff, teams, leaders into a collaborative process to create something that actually works for people, then, you know, there's hope. Whereas with classical government evaluation, you know, there's not much more hope than there will be a long report telling how everybody's screwing up, right? So, so I think that there's this power of it. And, and, and then you have to deal with the fact that some staff will not necessarily be able to make that transition because they can't see themselves and their professionalism being part of that new reality, being part of that change. And as I said earlier, some of the staff may not be part of the organization going forward. I've seen schools being transformed, hospitals being transformed, and every time somebody needs to go. But most of them, as you said earlier, most people working in government services, and I think a lot of people working in business, want to do well, want to do good, and are prepared to try really, really hard to align their professional practice with actually creating something that's that are, you know, better outcomes and is good for people. We yeah, you, go ahead. I don't. Oh, uh, yeah. Up, up. No, you go, you. Um, so, so Alex from Live Work in London. I just want to build on that point. Uh, this I, is the last question, by the yeah, way. Yeah, I, I would actually go so, so far as to say that the uh, health professionals, as a specific case, but uh, oftentimes frontline staff in general, are super, super driven to deliver a better job. They are, in fact, within. We're doing some work with the Department of Health in the UK at the moment. And the uh, health visitors and midwives that we're working with are desperate to be able to deliver better. It's not just a mild enthusiasm, and it's certainly not being scared or anxious. It's they are super desperate, because there are some organizations, and obviously the NHS is probably a very good example, are in a fairly bad state right now. And they really do see the value that, uh, that design and these kind of interve interventions can bring. So that's a good thing. All right, well, there's probably tons more questions and more discussion, but I, I want to thank Billy, Ryan, and Christian for kicking us off and getting the conversation flowing, and uh, thank you very much.